Good morning, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are on listen only. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. I do apologize today, all participants will be on listen only for the duration of today's conference. I would like to inform participants that the call is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I would now like to turn the call over to your conference host, to Mr. Whit McGraw. Sir, you may begin. Uh, terrific. Uh, all right, let's get started. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Uh, my name is Whit McGraw, and I'm the America's uh, Regional Market Leader for S&P Capital IQ. And on behalf of our uh, entire organization, welcome to today's webinar entitled Risky Business, Best Practices in Counterparty Credit Risk Management. We have a great program for you today featuring speakers Rick Canungo, who's our global head uh, of our solutions architect organization within S&P Cap IQ, and Kevin Winpazinger, who is the manager of worldwide credit operations for IBM. Uh, before we jump into the, into the program, I think you probably noticed uh, a new name of ours, S&P Cap IQ. And so I think most of you know, uh, certainly know S&P, right? Um, so a long history, experience in the financial markets, kind of specifically around credit. I think I would guess the, the majority of you know Capital IQ, which is really kind of a, a deep fundamental um, financial information database with powerful analytic tools. Uh, we made the conscious decision in 2010 to bring uh, those two capabilities or businesses together. And so today we are now S&P Cap IQ, and you know, our focus is really providing kind of a multi-asset class data research and analytic offering uh, serving institutional investors, um, investment advisors, wealth managers, and you know, certainly corporations and commercial lenders as well. Uh, just one note, um, so the Standard Poor's Credit Rating Organization is, a, uh, is an independent and separate uh, business unit organization uh, than that of S&P Cap IQ. So a few logistical items before we get started. Uh, this webinar is net enhanced with supplementary slide presentation. Slide presentation. You'll need to be logged into uh, my meetings in order to participate uh, in the Q&A session that will follow the presentation. Questions may be submitted online, and so we're going to do questions at the, the end. Uh, but, you know, throughout the presentation, if, uh, if you have questions that come to mind, uh, please feel free to do it through the, the, the My Meetings. Um, and then lastly, I think the, the slides uh, from today's presentation will be distributed kind of at the conclusion. We'll have those uh, mute, uh, emailed out to you folks. So as I mentioned, today's webinar features a discussion between uh, Rick and Kevin. Uh, both have extensive experience in the RIC space. Just, you know, real quickly, I, I know you can see the bios uh, on, the, on, the, on the webinar uh, in the slides, but uh, Rick is a, leads a global team of subject, uh, subject matter experts who develop cross-asset solutions for corporate treasurers, investment banks, commercial lenders, wealth managers, as well as investment professionals. Rick also led uh, two, of, uh, two products within our S&P Cap IQ organization, Credit Health Panel, as well as risk to price, uh, where he kind of led the development, product development, and commercial strategy. He has over 15 years of experience um, in, the, in the broader space. Uh, he's also a, a chartered uh, financial analyst. Uh, Kevin is responsible for uh, IBM's credit policies, controls, portfolio reporting, square models, and systems across all lines of business. He has uh, over 22 years of experience at IBM uh, and has held a, a variety of uh, positions and responsibilities uh, from accounting to pension to treasury as well as pricing. He is also a registered uh, chartered financial analyst. So uh, in today's discussion, uh, just kind of setting the backdrop a little bit, uh, we'll explore challenges and best practices in navigating the changing landscape of counterparty credit risk management. Uh, we'll dive into topics like uh, what indicators or strategies to consider during origination uh, or even surveillance, um, as well as how to assess sovereign risk and think about sovereign risk kind of in, in this kind of broader discussion around the counterparty assessment. So before I turn it over to, um, turn it over to Rick and Kevin, I just wanted to uh, set the backdrop um, in terms of kind of how we think about credit risk. Um, so looking at the slide, so slide four we have up right now. So just you know, I'm going to spend 15 seconds here just kind of uh, setting the context. So when we think about uh, credit risk or we think about a, really a spectrum, right, there, there's, there's, there's a degree or there's a spectrum in which, you know, I think we all, whether you are doing surveillance-related activities or origination or your supply chain credit risk manager within a corporation, you know, sometimes there's need for looking longer term, sometime, you know, more point in time or, you know, there, there's various needs. And so, um, if you look at this slide, you know, certainly down at the bottom right, you know, the far left, you know, you have really more fundamentally, fundamentally driven, longer run, longer term, you know, related, uh, related 
capabilities, right, or the, the, in terms of assessing credit. To the far right, you have more market-driven point in time. So, you know, just looking at the top boxes, I won't go through each one, but far left, when you think, of, when you think about fundamentally driven long run, you think about ratings, right, the core, core ratings, product, and capability. On the far right, um, you know, we have what we call our market drive signals. So those are uh, really incorporate credit, credit default swaps, so really bringing kind of market uh, based information into the thinking. And again, that's more point in time. And then kind of in between, there's, um, you know, there's varying degrees of, uh, of, of ways that we assess credit, uh, whether it be peer benchmarking or probably a default or a whole host of other things. But I just wanted to give you that context, right, because I think as you hear from Rick and Kevin, um, they'll be alluding to some of those things. So I think at this point, uh, I'll hand it over to Kevin, and we'll start, uh, we'll start the session. Okay. Thanks, Whit. Uh, so I'm on page uh, five here. Uh, just want to give you a, a brief overview of uh, uh, IBM. Uh, it's, it's a large $107 billion revenue company. Uh, we do business in 170 countries worldwide, and we're focused on uh, IT solutions uh, and, and uh, business process uh, solutions and integrating those two things uh, to help our clients. Uh, with 170 countries, it's pretty obvious where we've got global capabilities in, in services, software, uh, systems, research, uh, and uh, for all of these uh, things that we sell, uh, we also offer financing. Uh, IBM's credit function, uh, we support the entire uh, IBM organization, and that goes across all those lines of businesses. So we have uh, credit evaluations for things that are very short-term, uh, purchase uh, transactions for direct customers, uh, as uh, you know, going through longer-term services contracts, and then uh, financing uh, uh, originations that can last uh, for uh, three to five years. Uh, and we cover that entire uh, time span of, of credit risk. The IBM Global Financing uh, Unit is the captive financing group of IBM. Uh, we're we're uh, originating assets in over 40 countries, uh, and our goal is to uh, support IBM customers in their acquisition of IT solutions. We also have a financial mission uh, which is to uh, uh, make sure that we earn a reasonable uh, return uh, on the assets that we originate. Um, when we originate those assets, our intent is generally to hold them. Uh, we, we do have some uh, syndication sales for risk mitigation purposes, but our, our main goal is to uh, hold the assets that we originate. And so our, our credit focus is, is making sure that credit risk is considered in making business decisions. Uh, and that it is uh, that we're out there to support uh, IGF in meeting its financial targets. The uh, three or four main topics that I want to talk about today, uh, where where credit focuses, is, is uh, at the originate at the origination of the uh, uh, asset acquisition um, process. Uh, after we have the assets on the books, uh, we. Uh, maintain a uh, monitoring on them so that we uh, ensure their health uh, of the assets is good. Uh, we then also look at the uh, overall portfolio uh, so that we can uh, avoid any surprises uh, uh, based on how uh, companies evolve over time. Uh, and then uh, also uh, lately sovereign risk has become a, uh, a very important uh, factor in our uh, credit decisioning. So uh, moving on to page seven. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about origination uh, risk first. Uh, so the accuracy uh, in, in, in assigning the risk rating is very important. Um, our, our pricing uh, with our customers uh, for financing is tied to that risk rating. Uh, we want to price uh, correctly for the risk. Uh, we want to be competitive as well, so we don't want a conservative or liberal bias in our ratings. The ratings will also influence the terms and conditions that we offer the customers. Uh, so uh, we may shorten or lengthen uh, the term of the deal that we're uh, agreeing to or change security requirements based on, on the risk rating. Uh, it also affects hold levels. Uh, so we have hold levels so that we, we do not become overly concentrated in any uh, one customer or industry. And uh, while several factors affect the hold level, the most, uh, the most important factor is the risk rating that we assign. Uh, and, and, and this tells us whether we, we can originate all of the business that they want and hold it or whether we will have to have mitigation uh, activity after the fact. We also uh, need to be very efficient. Uh, the time is of the essence in most of our deals, and we're here to support sales and closing the deals. So the processes that we, we put in place have to be very fast. 
Uh, in addition to being fast and efficient, we want to be consistent. Uh, and, and the way that we achieve both of these goals is uh, smallest deals are handled through proprietary scoring models, uh, leaving the analysts free to handle the largest deals. And in order to get that efficiency uh, and speed of decision along with consistency, uh, we start with S&P Capital IQ. Uh, actually, we start with Standard & Poor's credit rating. Uh, and if, if that's there, then that, that forms a baseline for our uh, assessment. Uh, if, if that is not there, um, or even when it is, we look for, for other data points with the S&P Capital IQ credit model scores. Uh, and we like this because uh, this is a, a little bit more quantitative and gives us a different perspective on the risk. We augment that by the uh, market derived signals, which is the CDS implied type rating. Uh, so we're, we're getting kind of three different uh, views, an analytical view, a fundamental view, and a market-based view. Uh, all, all at one time at the beginning of the decision to uh, create uh, a, a base of, of what uh, rating we're going to give. After that, uh, we then use uh, financial information and any other uh, market information that we uh, might have from the customer uh, to validate that we're comfortable with where those ratings are pointing us. Uh, if there's been any new uh, uh, information, new earnings releases or, or changes in the industry, uh, and also uh, let the analyst experience uh, uh, play a factor uh, in, in creating that final rating. Uh, one, one last point on consistency. Uh, we do like to uh, compare what the analysts come up with with uh, the S&P ratings and identify any biases. Uh, if we find uh, an analyst uh, has a bias either one way or the other, we like to, to understand why. We encourage them to have a bias if, if they've got new information. And we, we also like to discourage a bias if it is not based on, on, on good facts, and, and using S&P as a benchmark uh, allows us to identify that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick to show some of the tools that uh, I referenced in this chart. Thank you, Kevin, and hello, everyone. Um, to start off with, uh, you know, I'm going to focus on uh, the screening process uh, during origination. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, during origination, what's key is efficiency, and uh, with that uh, comes the corollary of speed. Uh, but we also want to incorporate uh, credit metrics uh, during that process. So I uh, kind of draw the analogy uh, with that of um, a car and the brakes in the car, which I feel you know lets uh, someone actually drive fast, because otherwise they imagine how fast you drive a car uh, that does not have brakes. Um, so how do we incorporate uh, credit metrics in the origination process? So obviously, along with uh, business considerations, uh, you know, one could uh, pick uh, financial ratios, and different uh, companies have different thresholds or appetite or tolerance for risk. And also, these thresholds would depend on uh, the industry of the counterparty that one's looking at. So in this example, uh, we're looking at the Internet uh, retail industry uh, for companies that are in the United States. Uh, for total assets greater than uh, 50 million, and then a few uh, credit-specific uh, metrics such as uh, return on capital uh, greater than 5%, uh, asset turnover, which is total assets over uh, revenue, EBITDA margin leverage, and uh, EBIT interest coverage uh, ratio. So based on these um, credit metrics, uh, we quickly whittled down the universe of Internet retail companies from 14,000-odd to uh, 14 that you know, we were looking at, and the results from that uh, screening activity is uh, the bottom half of the screen there. And the results are sorted by uh, the Standard & Poor's uh, ratings. So as you'll notice that um, a lot of the rated companies are actually spec rate companies. So there are double B plus and double B uh, companies as part of that list. And that simply implies that the credit thresholds that we chose, either by design or otherwise, did not limit the results to only investment grade companies. Uh, which also, therefore, implies that the ones that are not rated uh, could actually be spec rate companies, and some within those could be low spec rate companies. So these are the ones we want to focus on and perform deeper analysis. So starting with the universe of companies, we narrowed it down to 14. There were some that were rated, and as Kevin mentioned, you know, that becomes a starting point for the analysis, uh, but the ones that are not rated, they merit uh, deeper analysis. In particular, uh, I'm going to pick uh, one out of the list of the non-rated companies, uh, the third from the bottom, 1-800-Flowers.com. So moving on to the next slide, um, I guess the relevance here with IBM is um, also that 1-800-Flowers.com is uh, one of their customers. 
um, and that information we have in our systems through the 10K filing of uh, 1-800-Flores.com. They list um, that uh, they license software from IBM. And as we noted in the previous uh, slide, they are not rated by standard poor's. Uh, we noticed that they have a significant amount of debt on their balance sheet. That's 28.5% of their total capital. And more importantly, the current portion of long-term debt, which is the debt that's coming due within the next 12 months, is at a whopping 85.6%. Um, <clears throat> so just from those metrics, uh, it's obvious that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, this merits uh, further deeper analysis. In this slide, uh, we're going to focus on two categories of uh, credit metrics. So we're uh, still with 1-800-Flowers.com. On the left-hand side, we're going to look at uh, relative metrics. And on the right-hand side, we're going to look at a couple of um, absolute measures of credit worthiness. So when we say relative metrics, they're relative to a set of peers. Uh, we define the peer group based first on the GICS industry classification code. Uh, which is the global industry classification code, so uh, peers within the same industry. And uh, within that, we look at companies that are similar in size as measured by revenue and EBITDA. So among these global set of peers, uh, we find that you know, 1-800-Flows.com has an overall score of above average, but if we look at the constituents of that overall score <clears throat> by various categories, such as operational efficiency, um, intermediate term solvency and short term liquidity, we see, we see there is a disparity between these constituents. In particular, we notice that the short term liquidity score is bottom among its peers. So that would be one area that we would want to delve in deeper and actually see what are the drivers of that uh, uh, lower liquidity score. Uh, before we move on, on the right hand side of the screen, we have two quantitative credit measures. First, the probability of default. Uh, and we'll cover that in a little more detail uh, when we talk about surveillance. Uh, but the credit model score, uh, Kevin alluded to it earlier, it is a quantitative score. It's based off uh, financials. And um, we noticed that it is a spec rate. It's a low spec rate, um, single B. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on the liquidity score and this uh, quantitative uh, credit model score. Wait a second for the slide to show up, and here we go. Um, so in the previous screen, we looked at uh, the different panels, um, operational solvency and liquidity. And here on the right-hand side of the screen, we have the constituents of those panels, the detailed metrics um, for each of those panels. On the far right, we have two columns showing the entities' uh, values as well as the peer group average. So on the bottom right of that screen are the liquidity metrics. So of the five liquidity metrics listed there, we notice there are a couple uh, that are actually bottom among the peers. Um, the first among those is the basic defense interval. Uh, and what that basically is is how much of cash, short-term investments, and receivables are on hand to pay for interest expenses, taxes, and other operating expenses. And we notice that uh, 1800 Flores seems a little strained in that respect in that they only have 17 days' worth on hand. Uh, relative to the uh, peer group average of about 120, uh, 120 days. Moving on uh, to the quick ratio, it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, yes, it is bottom among its peers, uh, but also we'd like to focus on the quick ratio as opposed to the current ratio because the difference between the two is really inventories. And uh, for a company like 1-800-Flowers.com, presumably the inventory that they have on hand is uh, not um, – you know, something that you know they can hold on to for very long because these could be perishable uh, items. Um, so looking at the quick ratio, what we'd like to see, yes, this bottom, but what is the trend? Has it been um, improving, deteriorating? Has it held steady? And so that's what we see in the chart on the bottom left of the screen. We see the trend lines. The blue bars um, are the numbers for the entity, and the gray uh, vertical bars are the numbers for the peer group. So while the entity's metrics are far lower than that of the peer group, we kind of notice that it is in a steady holding pattern. So at least it is not a deteriorating story there. So having looked at the liquidity metrics, uh, we'd now move on to look at the absolute measure of credit worthiness that uh, we had mentioned earlier. 
and we notice there's a lowercase um, rating of D. So first, uh, the reason why it's lowercase is to distinguish it from the Standard Poor's uh, rating, uh, which in this case, uh, it is not rated. So how do we arrive at this uh, lowercase B score? So just uh, very quickly on the credit uh, model itself, so these are uh, models based off financials, and um, you can see the credit metrics uh, used in uh, this particular model on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, the ratios depend on the industry as well as the geography, and in some cases the country of the issuer. So they're not the same for every company, uh, but they are driven by financials. So the process is to look at the rated companies within that industry, within that geography, and to see how the metrics uh, relate to that rating, and then learning from the rated universe, apply that to the unrated companies. Uh, the model's uh, pretty sophisticated and is out of scope uh, from today's discussion, but uh, suffice to say that uh, uh, that items like non-linearity and uh, non-monotonicity are accounted for within the model. So it's not just a linear regression of factors and weights. Um, in this particular case, uh, we noticed that um, for uh, the company chosen, the internet retail company, uh, we're looking at uh, the item values. And if you look at the right-hand side columns, there are the rank sensitivities of uh, these items. And we noticed that total assets and return on capital are among the highest um, uh, sensitivities. So essentially, this would allow one to shock uh, these metrics to see whether the rating would hold um, at the single B level or it would migrate down to, say, double C or um, even single C. So if there is a 20% shock to the most sensitive factor like total assets or uh, to return on capital, would it migrate down? So that's really you know, one of the purposes of going into detail with uh, these metrics and uh, looking at uh, you know, which metrics uh, carry the most sensitivity. So before we uh, move on to the next section, which is surveillance, just wanted to do a quick recap here. So as Whit mentioned before, it is important to look at uh, multiple uh, views of credit uh, fundamentals, uh, market views, uh, which are important between reporting periods before the next financials come out. Uh, it is also important to look at credit thresholds, as uh, Kevin mentioned uh, during the origination process. Uh, and it's possible to quickly screen, and uh, industry participants uh, do uh, screen for size, profitability, leverage, uh, debt service capacity, et cetera. Um, and also uh, definitely want to focus on the unrated companies because uh, there is that element of uncertainty there, and it's important uh, in that regard to do peer comparisons, look at trends, and uh, also absolute credit scores. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Kevin to speak about uh, surveillance. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, as, as I started, we uh, originate the assets, and once they're on our books, uh, we intend to hold them. Uh, so to make sure that we understand uh, our, our book of assets, uh, we do have some uh, surveillance activities that we execute. Uh, the first one, and uh, possibly the most important one, is, is watching the uh, daily upgrade or downgrades on our uh, customers, uh, especially those with uh, deals that are pending. Uh, any significant change in uh, credit quality while we are uh, working on a deal uh, has to be communicated to the sales team and uh, evaluated for how, how we want to change whatever, uh, whatever uh, deal we're working on. Uh, additionally, uh, even if there's not a deal pending and we see a significant upgrade or downgrade, we update our internal system uh, you know, as soon as possible so that uh, at any point in time uh, we can be looking at uh, a, a, an accurate and current risk rating uh, within our uh, internal credit system. Uh, now, if, if uh, an entity has not had any uh, uh, upgrade or downgrade activity in a while and we have not been uh, issuing any new ratings, uh, we will at least once a quarter uh, look at the customers uh, to ensure that we are still comfortable with the rating that we have. Um, our primary tool for, for doing this is the market-derived signals. Uh, again, this relies on uh, CDS implied uh, ratings. Um, the CDS implied ratings uh, do tend to be uh, volatile, and uh, we do uh, use uh, judgment in terms of uh, uh, deciding when uh, we will follow those or when we may want to uh, wait and, and see if it's uh, more of an anomaly uh, rather than a trend on the uh, customer risk. 
The updated ratings uh, impact uh, the reserves uh, that we have. Our reserves are uh, based on, on the risk of the company, and if that increases or decreases, then we would uh, change uh, the reserve we apply against them. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, hold levels are, are mainly based on the rating, and if that rating changes, uh, then we uh, go back through the risk mitigation uh, evaluation and decide if we have uh, uh, an overhold position, uh, what we intend to do with that. And we also use the quarterly assessment uh, to identify any trends uh, that we're seeing uh, either regionally or through industries, uh, just to be more aware of uh, uh, where, where future problems might lie. Uh, so in addition to going through the portfolio to get uh, all the ratings updated, we also have a quarterly portfolio review process. Uh, based on these ratings, we estimate our potential losses and the range of potential losses. Um, we'll also uh, evaluate if uh, we're seeing either the customer or industry concentration changing and what the risks are for those groups. Uh, and, uh, you know, increasing concentration and increasing risk uh, would, would not be a good, uh, a good uh, portfolio trend. Um, and then, uh, as I said, with the whole doubles, uh, the portfolio review feeds our risk mitigation uh, process uh, so uh, that we're always holding the uh, appropriate amount of uh, assets for the risk uh, of, of a customer or industry. Uh, the last kind of uh, surveillance activity that we do is uh, stress testing the portfolio. Um, and, and, and this is based on using uh, optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. Uh, for pessimistic, we look uh, into the not too uh, uh, far past, uh, 2008, uh, where we saw, you know, very high uh, probability of default and very high default rates um, on, on public companies. Um, for future forecasts, uh, we typically look at the S&P speculative grade forecast um, and uh, use that as a, uh, a model for our pessimistic case. With those new probabilities of default, we, we look at how would our, industry, uh, how would our uh, portfolio react, and we try to look at that uh, both uh, within a country level and an industry level and uh, also uh, for, for our highest concentrated, uh, our, our highest exposure customers. And we look at that over time and also our portfolio relative to the broader market uh, to see if we are in line with the overall market or uh, uh, drifting away from that. And uh, if, if we see those differences uh, start to show up, uh, we'd like to understand why that's the case um, and uh, uh, whether we need to uh, be doing anything different in our evaluations um, to uh, uh, ensure that we're getting the right set of uh, customers uh, in and we're rating them appropriately. Um, so, uh, those, 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 excuse me, those are the four main uh, or three main uh, activities that we do for uh, surveillance, uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're really focused on making sure that we avoid any surprises uh, down the road based on the assets that we have. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so we're going to focus on a few case examples here, and uh, essentially uh, the first three slides, we're going to focus on three different uh, market-based credit measures. Uh, that are used in the surveillance process and uh, then talk a little bit about um, stress testing. So uh, the three different uh, market-based measures that we're going to look at uh, are going to be based on CDS, uh, equity markets, and the bond markets. In uh, this particular slide, we're looking at Chesapeake Energy, and we're going to focus on the uh, CDS-based market-derived signals. So on the chart, uh, we see the blue line is uh, essentially the ratings, and uh, the yellow line uh, represents the CDS-based uh, market-derived signal. And you can see um, early in the year, the market-derived signal was showing creditworthiness of the market sentiment uh, lower than that of uh, the Standard Poor's rating. And the first blue dot on the left-hand side is uh, when Chesapeake Energy uh, was put on uh, outlook negative. And uh, eventually, uh, there were a couple of downgrades um, during April and May, late April and mid-May. So essentially, in this case, uh, the market uh, negative sentiment uh, w foreshadowed uh, the ratings actions that uh, followed. So that's uh, an example of um, how market participants uh, will often uh, complement uh, looking at long-run measures such as, um, as uh, ratings with uh, market sentiment measures that reflect, um, you know, the, the daily news breaking the market regarding uh, the, the sector or that particular uh, entity. Moving on from a CDS-based uh, signal to an equity-based signal, so we're looking at probability of default 
Now, uh, one advantage of the probability of default is that um, it has a much larger coverage than the CDS universe. So we can only monitor market derived signals from CDS um, if there is uh, uh, credit default swap quotes uh, for those entities. But if it is a public company, there's pretty much uh, an equity price. The probability of default model is anchored in financials but the day-to-day -day changes are predicated on the stock price and the stock price volatilities. Uh, so the list of uh, companies we have here are essentially looking at um, companies that uh, during the year in 2012 were put on credit watch negative at various times uh, during the year and how the probability of default uh, values moved in a seven-week period prior to going on credit watch negative, which is the first indication that a ratings action might follow, that a negative ratings action might follow. And in this case, um, in each case, there was uh, an eventual negative ratings actions. So you can see the before and after ratings on the slide. Uh, but notice uh, how sharply a lot of the probabilities of default um, arose uh, for each of these cases, ranging from 50% rise to even 5,000% uh, rise. And it so happens in the middle of the list, we uh, see Chesapeake Energy. So this is uh, essentially corroborating what the CDS markets uh, conveyed um, through the widening of spreads. Uh, the equities markets uh, perceived similar, uh, uh, similar risk with Chesapeake. Moving on from um, equities-based signal to a bond market-based signal. Um, here we're going to look at uh, bond yields. And uh, we have the bond yields plotted against uh, time to maturity. Uh, by each rating category, and we're focusing on the consumer discretionary sector. So if we look at the plots, uh, if, uh, for example, uh, one has exposure to an entity that has a single B rated bond outstanding and it's, um, it has 10 years remaining to maturity, you start uh, monitoring the yield on that bond, and if it's going above, say, the, uh, the average of 7%, uh, in this case, the trend line of 7%, then, you know, one could infer that perhaps the bond market perceives the credit worthiness to be deteriorating uh, below that of uh, the official rating, and perhaps there might be a ratings action that might be forthcoming. So, essentially, we looked at uh, CDS-based, equity-based, and uh, bond market-based signals to complement the official uh, rating um, of, for uh, some of these exposures. So having looked at uh, market-based signals for surveillance, uh, how do we bring it all together? Um, as Kevin mentioned, um, a lot of industry participants uh, would like to monitor their exposures um, in a screen like a dashboard where they're looking at uh, the different metrics uh, you know, side by side and also seeing how they have changed over time, so over a week, month, quarter. Uh, depends on the nature of business and the kinds of exposures and the hold levels, obviously, and those thresholds can be set. Uh, and what we get is sort of a heat map to say, okay, you know, which metric deteriorated over this period and by how much. And that very quickly allows uh, the surveillance analyst to zero in on those, uh, you know, call it problem credits or the ones that uh, one needs to really zero in on. So, um, Moving on from the portfolio view, we're going to talk a little about stress testing. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, a lot of industry participants like to uh, compare optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. And fortunately or unfortunately, we have a recent uh, precedence in terms of uh, you know, dark day scenario. So here we've uh, listed uh, default rates uh, by rating category from our database. And uh, what we notice is uh, that it, not only is it important to Note that, um, yes, during recessions, default rates rise, but how do we quantify those? Because uh, we do need to provision for losses, but it's important to quantify that and so, so that we're not leaving money on the table, putting too much in provisions or too little, uh, whereby we're going to be exposed to these losses. So if we look at the numbers for, um, say, spec rates at double B, we notice that between the 2005 to 7 period and the 2008 to 10 period, there is essentially almost a doubling of the values, actually more than doubling of the values uh, of uh, default rates. And uh, looking further down to single B, uh, the default rates uh, essentially more than tripled. So that gives uh, sort of perspective on you know how the default rates for the same rating category move during different um, you know, economic conditions. A lot of industry participants also like to compare against their long run, like 30 year um, averages, and um, you know others like to uh, go further granular and look at industry specific migrations. 
So these are just various ways, you know, one could look at uh, one's uh, portfolio of holdings and um, uh, based on the credit concentrations, uh, sort of estimate what kind of, uh, you know, shocks would lead to uh, what kind of uh, default rates. So to sum it up, uh, you know, back to the slide we um, sort of uh, began with, uh, with uh, walked uh, you through these. So on the left-hand side, you know, we have uh, fundamentals-driven uh, credit measures, uh, longer run uh, sort of through the cycle-type measures. And, um, you know, the most common one, of course, is ratings that incorporates not only financials and quantitative uh, metrics, but also a lot of qualitative metrics. So a lot of, um, you know, uh, industry participants will ask us for the unrated companies um, as well, you know, whether we can uh, provide uh, similar models and metrics that incorporate quantitative and qualitative metrics. And uh, we do have uh, some of those models, and they're uh, very um, popular, especially with um, a lot of the commercial lenders uh, to comply with their uh, regulatory needs. Uh, but then there are other measures that are purely driven by uh, quantitative metrics, looking at financials. And, uh, you know, earlier we talked about the credit model scores, which are essentially giving you a lower case uh, rating. And then on the right-hand side, we have purely market-driven measures, such as uh, CDS-based market signals. We looked at probabilities of default uh, that incorporate uh, market measures, such as um, equity prices, but also uh, are, in, uh, are anchored in financials. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Kevin to um, discuss sovereign risk. All right. Thanks. Uh, so sovereign risk has been a, uh, a topic of increasing focus over the last few years uh, for, for a couple of reasons uh, at IBM. Uh, one is areas that have traditionally been very safe uh, are, are looking riskier. Uh, and that uh, is, is uh, really uh, talking about Europe and, and the Eurozone. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the activity that was going on in Greece over the last year and a half uh, has, re has really made uh, that a, an area that's riskier and, and one where we want to uh, spend a little more time focusing on, on the sovereign risks. Uh, another element uh, is that uh, the growth markets, uh, by definition, are growing fast, uh, and IBM's participating in those. And so uh, we're getting into countries uh, – uh, we're growing the assets in the countries uh, where we uh, have not been as uh, as had as large a portion of the portfolio before, and we're we're looking at new countries and and, and new risks there. So for both of those reasons, uh, we've been paying a little more attention to uh, the sovereign risk. We've also seen um, in uh, Europe, in particular, how closely related the sovereign risk is to the financial uh, industry risk, the banking uh, uh, customer risks. Uh, and, and this is not too surprising given the implicit guarantee that most banking systems have from their, uh, from their governments, uh, but again, uh, fr from an environment that had been fairly stable for many years, uh, as the sovereigns become a little bit more volatile, the, the financial industry uh, uh, risk has become uh, more volatile as well. And uh, we're, we're watching that very, very closely uh, and how that impacts our, our customers. So uh, w w while we're looking at the uh, changes in, in, in sovereign risk, uh, one of the other impacts that it has in terms of how we're handling credit is uh, as sovereigns get downgraded, uh, we typically do not allow uh, corporates to be rated higher than their, uh, than their sovereign's rating uh, because basically the sovereign represents the risk of doing business in that country. Uh, and, and even a very healthy corporate cannot escape the, uh, the, the environment that the sovereign sets. Uh, and again, this can impact our hold bubbles if, if we take a, a rating down for a sovereign, and that uh, triggers a lot of risk mitigation uh, evaluation uh, and trying to assess uh, what, what we want to do uh, with our corporate customers as a result of that sovereign impact. So watching that and watching uh, the, the outlook, uh, the credit watch uh, uh, indicators, uh, and also watching the uh, uh, CDS of the sovereign as well as the MDS of the financial markets are all uh, factors that we're, we're trying to tie together into our evaluations uh, that, that we were probably not as focused on, uh, say, two years ago uh, as, uh, as a result of the environment that we're, uh, we're experiencing today. So, Rick, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, 
We've been uh, noticing uh, over the past couple of years that uh, there has been an increasing um, rise in uh, monitoring real-time information uh, with respect to um, sovereign risk. As Kevin mentioned, um, you know, businesses are expanding into um, a lot of different countries, and um, there is a lot of uh, news and headline risk uh, related to you know, these economies, and there's a lot of movement that happens uh, very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> so increasingly, we notice uh, that folks are uh, monitoring FX rates, uh, market indices intraday, um, as well as you know, depending on uh, the business they are in, uh, commodity futures. Uh, which seem to fluctuate a uh, fair bit uh, intraday. And uh, <clears throat> Kevin also mentioned the importance of uh, CDS spreads while monitoring um, sovereigns. So in the slide, uh, <clears throat> looking at the you know, bottom right of the screen, we're focusing on um, Argentina. And uh, if uh, you notice that uh, toward the beginning of the year, uh, the blue line and the yellow line actually are the same. So the market derived signal based on CDS uh, sort of agreed with the rating, but then started um, the CDS started widening and the market derived signal fell below rating. And uh, Argentina went on uh, outlook negative on April 23rd, and then eventually got uh, downgraded um, late October. Uh, however, the market uh, have uh, continued to express a negative uh, sentiment, and uh, the CDS spreads continue to widen. Uh, at the top of the screen, uh, we see the CDS spreads. This was taken uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the spreads have uh, since come in a bit, but um, it, it's still uh, well above uh, 1,000 basis points, which is an order of magnitude uh, above sort of the rest of the uh, sovereigns that are listed there, and you can see uh, Pakistan, we mentioned, uh, is rated the same uh, single B minus, uh, but the CDS spreads seem to imply that um, you know, there is considerable risk uh, with respect to Argentina. So that's just the uh, you know, nature of game with um, sovereigns. And uh, before we uh, wrap this up, just wanted to do uh, quick uh, takeaways with respect to sovereign risk. So you know, we mentioned that uh, in case, um, a lot of companies uh, have operations uh, across the globe and are moving into frontier or emerging markets or increasing their exposure in emerging markets. So sovereign risk has become uh, <clears throat> front and center in the credit evaluation process and credit monitoring process, the importance of real-time information has uh, increased. Uh, CDS continues to be um, a worthy market uh, sentiment uh, signal that complements uh, longer-run uh, credit worthiness uh, measures. And uh, some other factors that we did not go into in depth, uh, such as ease of doing business, corruption perception, uh, global competitiveness, uh, we're increasingly utilizing uh, these metrics in assessing uh, country risk uh, when we uh, build and calibrate our models. So with that, I guess it's time for Q&A, and I'll turn it back over to Witt. Perfect. <clears throat> thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, appreciate it. Certainly um, a topical, uh, topical um, um, topic at this point, you know, a lot, a lot going on globally. So we have a number of questions that uh, have come in. Just as a reminder, you can submit questions by clicking on the, the Q&A box or the question answer box on the top of your screen. Um, and for, you know, I mean, as I said, I think we have, a, we have a number of questions, and so kind of within the 10, 15 minutes we have left, we'll, we'll try to address as many as we can. And for those that we don't get to, we'll make sure to get a, you know, reply back to you. Um, so this looks like probably the, this first one is for, for Kevin. Um, the question is, do you always limit your ratings to be at or below the sovereign rating? I think you, you talked a little bit about that. Uh, and so I just add, you know, has that always been your policy? Is this something new? You know, certainly in the past, you know, um, you know, five, six years, obviously, with the um, with the changing environment, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's been a fairly longstanding uh, uh, practice that we've got. Uh, as, as with any uh, guideline or, 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 or credit rule, you, you will find exceptions. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we always do, but uh, our exceptions have been very uh, few and far between, and, and typically is where uh, a uh, corporate – uh, either has a, a large presence outside of their home country, uh, so their assets and uh, cash flows are not uh, as, as tightly uh, controlled by the sovereign. Um, and, and, and we've generally seen that in uh, natural resource companies. Uh, so uh, in a couple of instances, we've, we, we've allowed the, the ratings of the uh, corporates to be a bit higher. 
uh, but we generally stick with that rule. Uh, again, as I said, because the, the risk of the country, uh, you can't really avoid that, uh, you know, by being located there. Yeah, certainly. Uh, great. Uh, appreciate that. So, um, you know, that this one probably, probably is for Rick. Um, so, uh, PDs are, are, are probably the default values. Um, they, depending on the, on the, on the sector or, or the type of company, they can be all over the place. So very, very volatile. You know, how do we, you know, how does one interpret those? Um, just would love to hear your opinion on that as well. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that question is uh, definitely very frequently asked, and uh, PDs do move around as um, they're predicated on the stock markets. Uh, so one way of looking at it, uh, how does it actually, or at what point does it actually convey a signal, um, is to see whether the PD has moved up and stayed up. Because um, uh, uh, you want to see whether the PD has um, gone to an elevated level and then sort of uh, maintained that level, maybe in order of magnitude, uh, you know, 50% rise and stayed there for 7 to 14 days. <clears throat> the other way to monitor it, uh, which a lot of folks uh, we've noticed do, is uh, to see how the PDs uh, rank within their peer group or within their industry. So if a PD rank within the industry has moved, um, say, from the third quartile to uh, the bottom quartile of um, uh, the other uh, peers in the industry, then obviously that's signaling that, you know, given the market conditions, that were even given where the industry is, there is idiosyncratic or company-specific uh, risk with respect to that entity. So by rank and by seeing how long the PD has stayed at an elevated level would be good ways of uh, interpreting the PD values. Terrific. Um, and a, a kind of a follow-up question. It's uh, not exactly related, but kind of back to Rick. And I think this is a good question because I think as, as most, you know, most folks know that, you know, in terms of analyzing companies or even in M&A or anything, right, the vast majority of companies that we're dealing with are private, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is specifically, you mentioned how you analyze an unrated company. How do you go about analyzing a private company that doesn't release financials publicly? Financials publicly. Sure. So a lot of times um, our uh, our clients uh, will have access to those financials even if they're not publicly available uh, by virtue of doing business with that company. So as part of uh, wanting to do business with that company, they will ask for those financials. Uh, now, we do have uh, about uh, 500,000 uh, private company financials um, in our database, but for companies that do not uh, you know, release that information, um, you know, the, if, if you're looking to do business, you would get some indication of that. Uh, and once you have those financials, you can obviously run it through our models, and, you know, we have a, a proprietary uh, database capability where you can take and store those financials, and, uh, you know, you can uh, store the scores that come along with those financials. Now, if there is uh, no information about that, um, you know, entity uh, in terms of uh, financials, a lot of times uh, people will look at uh, business-specific or industry-specific metrics, um, such as, you know, if it's a telecom company, if it's a wireless company, it'll look at, you know, what is the growth rate of subscribers, right? So especially with uh, startup companies, it becomes, uh, you know, very important not only to look at financials, even if financials were present, because, you know, you could see a lot of uh, negative profit, et cetera, uh, but to look at industry-specific metrics. And then benchmark those against the rated or the public companies um, where you kind of know where the industry median and, uh, you know, third quartiles are, and then compare that against uh, these private companies. Gotcha. Uh, perfect. So uh, back to Kevin, uh, and this is kind of related to stress testing. I actually have two questions here, and I'll, I'll try to weave them together. Um, the first question is, what types of stress testings do you do on your portfolio? And I think, again, we heard a little bit in terms of op optimistic and pessimistic, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, some of the different scenarios. And then the second question, question was related to stress testing um, in terms of measuring risk against the market. How is the market tolerance found? And so I think that really kind of relates to, again, when you're, when you're stress testing an overall portfolio, you look at a number of different things. If you could also uh, specifically address kind of how you um, – how, how is the market tolerance bound or measured? Okay. So in, in the stress testing, uh, we, we usually, uh, uh, not usually, we, we are using changes in probability of default. Uh, so what we do is we look for uh, historical periods or forecasts that would change the probabilities of default uh, on our current customer set. Uh, we, we then uh, analyze uh, if, if those probabilities of default changed, 
uh, what would the range of expected losses be. Uh, we're also starting to look at uh, modifying correlations. Uh, so uh, right now we don't really look at uh, industry correlations uh, uh, very much, although they do, uh, we know, historically uh, become much more highly cor correlated in periods of risk uh, or, or recessions. Uh, so we've not looked at that uh, yet, but we think that that is the, the next uh, enhancement in, in evaluating our, our stress testing. Um, in, in regards to comparing ourselves to the market, uh, what, what I meant when I said that is uh, if you look at, uh, say, the probabilities of default uh, for all of the companies in an industry uh, that S&P rates, and then we compare uh, the IBM customer set uh, to that, uh, we either come out uh, you know, with a slightly safer set of customers or riskier set or, or something very close. Gotcha. When we differ a lot, we'd like to understand why that is. And that's, that's the uh, difference that I was talking about that we investigated. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, very clear. So, again, uh, I, this is probably back to Rick, uh, specifically going back to the subject of probably default or, or PDs. Um, how, do you, how do you calculate uh, TD from an equity-based signal? Sure. <clears throat> so we have a couple of different models. Um, so depending on the availability of information, uh, our model for U.S.-based companies uh, incorporate um, financial ratios, uh, they also incorporate uh, industry-specific uh, metrics, such as uh, what is the you know, default rate for high-yield bonds and uh, you know, other industry metrics, uh, what are uh, loan charge-off rates uh, within that industry, uh, and also macroeconomic factors, such as uh, GDP growth uh, within the model. So to anchor the PDs based on macro industry and company-specific financials, and then essentially look at uh, stock price and stock price volatility. And as mentioned earlier, the stock prices do move around. So what we like to do is uh, not just look at the absolute value of the stock price. Uh, we look at the stock price rank to discern the idiosyncratic movement of the company within the industry. So if the prices are moving up in a market, we don't want to give uh, undue credit uh, just because there is momentum in the market. Uh, now, outside the United States, uh, you know, where there, we don't have uh, access to a lot of um, industry-specific metrics or we don't have credible information, we rely on uh, more of a Merton model, uh, which is essentially a structural model looking at um, stock price volatility and the leverage of the company. Thank you. Uh, so this question, I don't know, I think we could go uh, either Rick or Kevin, so maybe we'll, we'll get both of your uh, viewpoints um, if it's relevant. So for sectors such as banking, you know, the question here is, I've seen the market implied ratings usually track lower than the actual long-term ratings. How much emphasis should be placed on more short-term volatile uh, market-derived signals versus long-term, quote-unquote, through the cycle ratings when making an initial credit decision and then in terms of ongoing, ongoing management? And so uh, – you know, who wants to answer or who has a, who has a particular view on this one? Uh, well, I'll, I'll say that when we're looking at the market-derived uh, signals or market-implied ratings, uh, <laughs> they, they are volatile and they, they, they move around a lot. So we, we don't automatically just uh, go with what, what the market-implied rating is versus the uh, through-the-cycle uh, rating. Um, but particularly in the banking industry where we've seen uh, a very persistent uh, difference between the market uh, implied rating and, and the through the cycle rating, uh, we, we have certainly been going with the market implied rating uh, to uh, you know, evaluate the risk because we believe that the uh, market participants with money on the line are a pretty good indication makes, of, the, uh, makes sense. of the risk. Right, exactly. And just to add to that, so the market-derived signal essentially is based off CDS, which is very volatile, uh, but what the ratings franchise uh, in coming out with that has tried to do is um, to translate that into a uh, rating scale so there is some comparability. Uh, but as, um, as uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, we do notice that, you know, market participants seem to um, agree that, uh, you know, the market seems to sort of uh, be on the money with some of these and uh, ratings actions, um, you know, are sometimes following what the market sentiment is. And uh, that is uh, perhaps because one has to understand the nature of ratings is that they will only take action uh, once they have definitive information about, uh, you know, that particular entity that they're rating and not based on, uh, you know, perhaps um, some speculation of uh, negative news in the market. Gotcha. And just as, a, I guess, a, a follow-up, you know, maybe more specifically for Rick, you know, in, in talking about ratings and long-term nature, uh, this question is, you know, most countries seem to have a negative outlook these days. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, uh, does Standard & Poor's have a positive outlook 
on any country. <laughs> Just uh, off the top of my head, it, it is true that uh, you know, if you run down the list, uh, you'll probably see um, you know, the outlooks are negative for the vast majority, especially um, a lot of the European uh, countries. Uh, but off the top of my head, uh, I do remember that uh, you know, there are countries, especially in Latin America, such as uh, Colombia, Peru, um, and Chile, that are on outlook positive. And uh, there are probably a couple of countries um, in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, that's probably an outlook uh, positive. Uh, and besides, um, you know, the ratings outlook, uh, there are a few countries for which the MDS, which is the CDS-based, um, you know, rating scale score is actually higher than uh, that of uh, th than the implied ratings. And again, those are uh, like Brazil and uh, I think Philippines. Um, also, the markets seem to signal that you know, there might be a positive ratings action. Gotcha. And then in terms of, uh, again, going back to market drive signals, um, how often does S&P Cap IQ uh, revise the rating scale? Uh, how does that work? So um, the score is uh, daily, and, uh, you know, the models are calibrated uh, periodically. I don't think, uh, <clears throat> you know, we have a uh, set period. If we notice uh, regime shifts in uh, CDS, if we move to, uh, <clears throat> you know, a period of, uh, you know, economic change where we believe that the models need to be completely recalibrated, we will do that. Uh, but, again, suffice to say that, you know, that model is maintained by the ratings franchise, and they use it internally in their processes to monitor the credits that uh, their analysts are uh, rating. Gotcha. So I think, I mean, we have, um, you know, we have a, several more questions. I, I, have, um, I have one here, and I think we'll probably end on it. And, uh, um, and then, again, as I said before, you know, for questions that we got um, kind of via the WebEx, uh, we'll make sure to get responses back to you. Uh, this is sovereign risk, and, and so – Specifically, Argentina, and so I don't know. If we have a, you know, we'll have a clear answer here on this one. But you know, clearly, um, you know, there's a lot going on in Argentina in terms of you know the history of default. Uh, new government has um, you know, an activist uh, judicial uh, branch against foreign-owned entities, and you know, certainly going and operating in Argentina as a foreign-owned entity, there's there's a lot you need to be aware of. Um, how does this affect um, kind of the, the financial? Uh, and energy risk, so I don't know if we can speak to energy risk, but certainly the financial risk. How does this affect financial risk uh, in this country versus, you know, somewhere like uh, the EU or, or another kind of more stable uh, country or region? Who wants to take a stab at it? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, we, we talked about Argentina's uh, uh, CDS on, on one of the prior charts, and uh, this is one of the reasons why we, we like to look at the, the sovereign rating as a cap uh, for the ratings uh, in, in the country. Uh, the CDS would, would take into account a lot of these, uh, these types of risks and, uh, you know, help guide us toward the, uh, the appropriate rating for, for any corporate entity down, uh, you know, in, in, in Argentina. So, so I just point back to kind of our policy of, of, of following the sovereign rating as the cap. Yeah, that's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're out of time. Thank you to all uh, for your participation today. Uh, and on behalf of uh, S&P Cap IQ, uh, happy holidays. Thank you. Today's conference has ended. All participants may disconnect at this time.